professor of psychiatry at the International Medical School in Rome. He is co-author of Darwinian Psychiatry. And recently, I was uh, most interested to see that Oxford University Press has published your book on painting the mind. So, Professor Troisi, benvenuto a Londra. We look forward to your talk. So, first of all, thank you very much for this kind invitation, this prestigious location. I apologize for my English because my English is a combination of Roman slang, Italian language, and my experience of three years of working in California. So I don't have your beautiful accent, but I, I, I hope it's possible to have an exchange of ideas in spite of my poor English. So I, I am a clinician uh, and both an evolutionary psychiatrist. So my uh, dual role uh, um, makes me interacting with uh, clinicians uh, in, interested in knowing about the evolutionary theory. Uh, what my impression is that um, the, the, the mainstream psychiatry uh, is very far from the evolutionary approach, but at the same time what is important is that clinicians in their everyday work are very far from the evolutionary approach. So uh, my, my feeling is that evolutionary psychiatry is perceived as an, an academic curiosity that it's very useful for people with a uh, passion for basic science, but uh, with no utility for the clinical uh, work of uh, clinical psychiatrists. I'll give you some uh, mm, evidence for that. Uh, even if uh, there are uh, now many uh, publications in the field of evolutionary psychiatry, these are just three examples of textbooks that were um, published in different times. Um, and the, the idea, uh, it's uh, well uh, grasped in this statement, this is a very elegant statement. Despite the universal acceptance of evolutionary theory in all branches of the biological sciences, evolution is effectively ignored in mainstream medicine and psychiatry and psychology. Oh yeah, excuse me, excuse me, I'll, I'll look at the screen. Um, Partly because there is an only an emerging evidence based on the clinical applications of evolutionary theory to psychology and psychiatry. This is very elegant, but we can translate the same idea in less elegant uh, terms. What most clinicians really think is that uh, this is an interesting theoretical perspective with virtually no impact on clinical practice. When I when I give lectures to uh, my colleagues, uh, they say, that's really interesting, you know? But um, when I ask what will change in your everyday clinical practice, they say nothing. Because my uh, background is in neuroscience, my background is in psychoanalysis, my background in psychotherapy, uh, and I cannot apply your ideas about the evolutionary environment the uh, individual differences linked to uh, natural selection and so on. So uh, the, the thesis of my presentation, it's just the opposite. I think that th there are important clinical implications coming from evolutionary psychiatry, uh, and the, the mm, applications uh, concern all the important tasks of clinicians, prevention, uh, prediction of the course, the natural course of disorder, diagnosis, treatment. Uh, for reasons of time, I, I will focus just on diagnosis and treatment. But there are many examples uh, published in recent papers dealing with uh, prevention and uh, prognosis. So talking about diagnosis, I, I agree with Professor Ikos that diagnosis probably is the crucial uh, problem that we have now in psychiatry relative to other fields of medicine. You know that uh, DSM-5 is under attack mainly for uh, dubious validity, uh, problems with uh, high uh, rates of comorbidity, uh, and problems related to uh, medicalization of everyday life. Um, the, the problem is mainly related to uh, these 
um, pyramid, you know that in the rest of the medicine, they generally use information coming from pathophysiology or etiology to uh, separate different disorders. We are at the stage uh, that was formalized by Thomas Sydenham about 300 years ago. We use a syndromic diagnosis. And syndromic diagnosis is very weak related to other way of classifying disorders. Uh, in fact, uh, probably we are uh, grouping people with different disorders in the same category of DSM, and there are attempts, like in this slide, to propose a new way of reclassifying people to uh, diminish the heterogeneity of the categories that we use now. Uh, a, a useful attempt, in my opinion, it's the RDOC proposed by the NIMH, uh, they say we should focus on observable behavior, uh, we should focus on neurobiological measure. It's interesting that the approach of the RDOC is mainly uh, based on neuroscience, but I think that it can be reinterpreted in evolutionary <laughs> terms if you look at some specific aspects that can be uh, studied during the diagnostic um, process. Um, applying the evolutionary approach to uh, psychiatric diagnosis, I think that we should re revise our uh, way of collecting data, uh, modifying what information we collect during the diagnostic process and where we collect the information about diagnosis. So one important point comes from ethology. Ethology, it's uh, an evolutionary uh, discipline uh, apply it to the study of behavior, initially animal behavior, but there were important studies on human behavior too. And one key point in the ethological approach is direct observation of behavior. If you look at the situation in psychiatry, the situation is very different because during the diagnostic approach, we collect many, many data about the mental processes of the patient. And we collect this data talking with patients. And this is based on self-reports. So the patient talk with us and say about uh, emotions, uh, thought processes, feelings, and so on. Then there are data coming from the somatic um, aspects. This is growing because we are leaving the neuroscience revolution. We would like to have all the laboratory tests they have in the other fields of medicine, but just now we are using technologies like, you know, MRI and genetic uh, assessment and so on. What about behavior? <laughs> behavior is the third component of uh, the, the, the um, diagnosis, but we have very few information about actual behavior of people that we diagnose with mental disorders. The, mainly, th that kind of information comes from uh, reading scales. We use reading scales, we collect information, but this is the Hamilton reading scales for people with depression, and we ask about behaviors in, in the real world, but the reliability and validity of this kind of information is very low. If you compare the kind of information that we uh, can collect in the real world observing directly behavior. So uh, uh, it's possible to observe uh, directly behavior with the ethological method in psychiatry. My answer is yes, it's possible. Of course, you have to apply the method that they developed in, uh, in ethology. It's time consuming. It requires a training and probably uh, there, there are some, some ethical problems too because people don't like to be observed. You, you can ask people to make a genetic assessment of MRI and they uh, give you the informed consent. If you say, I would li just like to, to observe your, your behavior in the real world, it's a big problem in ethical terms. Uh, in spite of that, we should Remember that uh, in the 1973, uh, three ethologists were uh, awarded with the Nobel Prize for medicine. Uh, Corrad Lawrence, Nico Timbergen, and Carl von Frisch. So uh, th there is the, the, the potentiality to apply the uh, ethological approach uh, in psychiatry. 
Many years ago, I developed a, 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 an ethogram for observing people during diagnostic interviews. It's uh, just a list of um, behaviors that uh, are not um, shown only by people with mental disorder. This is common human behaviors that you can observe du during dyadic interviews. Uh, 37 different behaviors, mostly facial expressions and, and movements. These are universals, are not culture bound. So it's possible to observe the same behaviors in people coming from very different backgrounds. Um, I'll show you some clinical data obtained applying this method. This, is, this, study, this was a, a small study about people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia form disorder. So people with psychotic symptoms resembling the criteria for schizophrenia, but with uh, a short time uh, since the onset. So just uh, recording the, the um, frequency of eye contact with the interviewer during the diagnostic, the first interview, diagnostic interview, baseline interview, was possible to discriminate between patients with a good prognosis and patients with a poor prognosis. Uh, this is related to the, the, the capacity of these people to make uh, a social interaction with the clinician using a behavior that all we use for establishing affiliative uh, communication, so looking at the other in the eyes. Same information came from shut. Shut means to keep eyes closed for a long time. It's not a common behavior during dyadic interviews. We perceive something strange if this happens, you know, because having another person looking, looking, talking to you with the eye closed is not uh, acceptable. So again, people with poor prognosis uh, had this frequency very high <coughs> relative to the same patients with uh, uh, good prognosis. This is another study about uh, patients with uh, uh, depression. Again, baseline interview. Uh, they were studied in terms of um, response to drug treatment after about five weeks. Again, it was possible to separate people with a good response to drug treatment and people with a poor response to antidepressant drugs just on the base of nonverbal behavior during the baseline interview. Uh, both uh, affiliation, affiliative behavior, and assertive behavior were different in terms of frequency. Using the axi, this method, you have real numbers. The numbers that we have when we use the Hamilton depression scale or any other rating scale are not real numbers. We decide to give four, two, three to the patient based on our impression. These are real numbers. These are frequencies and duration of behaviors. This is another study um, focusing on patients with schizophrenia. Uh, the the prosocial behavior during the baseline interview were strongly correlated with uh, um, social disability in the real world, collected using the uh, Sheehan Disability Scale. Uh, you see that there is a strong relationship, uh, and in this sense, what the patient uh, does during the interview, it's like a model of what happens in the real world. But what is interesting is that in, uh, in a regression analysis, using many different variables, the exe prosocial pro score was more powerful in predicting social disability than a core symptom like uh, uh, anergia. You know that th these negative symptoms is considered a proxy for social disability, but including uh, the exe prosocial score in the regression model, uh, it came out that uh, the nonverbal behavior is more powerful in predicting social disability. So uh, even if the clinician uh, uh, doesn't use the ECSI in formal terms, so collecting 
uh, the, the duration and frequency of behaviors during the interview, information about the meaning, the evolutionary meaning of nonverbal behavior is very useful for clinicians. This is an example. Displacement activities are very common behaviors in many different animal species uh, reflecting uh, motivational conflict. So uh, if there are two motivational um, systems that are incompatible, like for example, approaching and avoiding, uh, very often the animal reacts with displacement activities, like dogs when they scratch themselves in a conflict situation, we make the same. So if you are aware that displacement activities like self-touching, scratching, uh, are reflecting uh, a conflict, it's very useful during the interview because it's possible that you are touching uh, an aspect and the patient says to you, everything is okay in my you know, marital relationship, at the same time scratches himself. <laughs> this is an important signal that probably this is a touchy aspect of uh, his life and the verbal information you are collecting is in contradiction with the nonverbal information uh, conveyed by nonverbal behavior. So having, you know, this kind of information can be useful even if you are not collecting quantitative data about nonverbal behavior. Another important point is the, uh, the um, relation in, in some sense, the opposition between symptoms and functional capacities. You know that um, now in medicine, in general, there is an appreciation of the importance of uh, uh, functional capacities um, that are uh, weakly related to symptoms. This is a scale proposed by the uh, World Health Organization. They say it's very important that in your patient you, you measure what are the functional capacities in, in everyday life, independently of the, the, the documentation and measurement of symptoms. Uh, I, I decided to show this study, but there are hundreds of studies demonstrating uh, how there are no strict <coughs> relationship between symptoms and uh, functional capacities in psychiatric patients. This is a study about patients with bipolar disorders they were studied when they were in complete remission. If you look at the uh, scores on the two rating scales, the Hamilton rating scales for measuring depressive symptoms and the Young Mania scale for measuring manic symptoms, they have uh, scores that are absolutely normal, no different from people uh, with uh, mm, healthy situation. Well, if you compare this ability in different domains, in controls and patients, even when they are in a condition of remission, they pay high price to social disability. So it's very important not to confound symptoms and functional disability. This is important for uh, evolutionary psychiatrists because we say that functioning is the real measure of adaptation. So symptoms are important, but at the same time, the core aspect of definition of any human disease is based on the assessment of functioning in the real life. Another implication is about the causal relationship between symptoms and functional disability because most clinicians in psychiatry think that functional disability is just the outcome of symptoms. So, for example, I am a psychotic patient, I have hallucinations, I have delusions, and so my uh, in relationships uh, are uh, destroyed by this symptom. This is absolutely true, but at the same time, there is the other possibility. So it's possible that people with reduced capacities in terms of functional um, ability, for example, the capacity to establish an effective relationship, the capacity to maintain an altruistic relationship in real life, they develop symptoms as a result of this basic deficit. Because symptoms can be the warning uh, signals that we develop when the situation is a situation of maladaptation. This is the, the uh, contribution that 
evolutionary psychiatry can give to the uh, understanding of the relationship between symptoms and functional disability. Um, in this paper that I published some years ago, uh, there is a discussion of this problem that I really love. It's my passion, but I have no time for uh, giving uh, all the details, the definition of mental disorder. You know, it's an important problem because there are many different approaches to definition. Consider that the, the main um, criteria that we use for identifying uh, a, a disease in all medicine are um, suffering, uh, statistical deviance, and organic lesions. Uh, all these three criteria are very dangerous when we look at these criteria from an evolutionary perspective. Just one brief comment about statistical deviance. We are a species of conformists. And we tend to consider people with a different behavior, for example, children with that kind of behavior that we uh, heard before, uh, people with uh, disorders. This is very risky because evolution is about diversity. Individual differences is the core of the evolutionary processes. So um, equating statistical average with the normality, it's uh, really a big mistake in medicine. Another important point is about the problem of where to collect information for the diagnosis. And this is the problem of ecological validity. Uh, this is another important evolutionary discipline, behavioral ecology. The, the focus of behavioral ecology is to study behavior in the natural environment from an evolutionary perspective. If you study the behavior of an animal in an artificial environment, sometimes you have information that is very far from the information you can collect in the natural environment. Because behavior is an important way for adapting, and the adaptation can be studied only in the natural environment. What about applying this kind of perspective to clinical psychiatry? Uh, in in, the, in uh, general medicine, they are becoming aware of this importance. This is a recent paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, the title is Re Real World Evidence. What is it and what can it tell us? Th think, for example, about cardiology. You can study the functioning of the heart of the patient in the office of the cardiologist, but what about the information we can collect using the holter? So you can record the real functioning of the art in the real world for 24 hours, and so you can have information about what happened to the heart when this person, for example, is arguing with the boss or is uh, uh, looking at the soccer team and TV and so on. That's the real information that we need to judge the functionality of the heart, not only what happens in the, the office, or in the world, in the clinical world. Uh, in psychiatry, we are, we are very far from applying these ecological methods. Uh, even if in child psychiatry, they made something that's very in interesting. This is the classical test used by Mary Answorth, uh, based on the attachment theory of John Bowlby, that I consider probably the founder of evolutionary psychiatry. Uh, it's the strange situation. So they observe directly behavior uh, to collect information about the attachment system of this child, exposing the children, the, 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 the child to a challenge, you know, a, a, a stranger entering in a room when the mother left. So in adult psychiatry, it's very difficult to apply this um, approach, but probably using new technology, we can have some information that it's uh, more valid in terms of ecological validity. This is, for example, the ecological momentary assessment. It's a way for recording uh, what happens in the real world using devices that now are very widespread, like, for example, the smartphone. So uh, the patient uh, brings the smartphone, and the smartphone uh, randomly uh, poses some questions about the situation the patient is living in that moment, uh, recording the mood, 
recording the uh, setting where the, the patient is living in that moment. And this way, you can have something that it resembles the halter for cardiologists, okay? What is interesting is that big money is going there. This is the website of MindStrong. MindStrong is a company with uh, uh, Tom Insel, that was the, the, the uh, previous, uh, the former director of NMH, now he's in a private company. And it's interesting what they say in the website. They were able to raise $14 uh, um, million dollars in one year for applying that kind of technology to studying <coughs> um, mental health and disorders. They say, clinical researchers rely on episodic subjective assessment of symptoms that do not translate well to day-to-day -to -day function. So if big money is going there, probably there is something very important in that kind of information. Another probably very important technology advancement is virtual reality. Through virtual reality, we can expose the patient to situations that resemble what happens in the real world, and that way we can get information about what is the real reaction of the patient in situations that are related to uh, malfunctioning, to symptoms, and so on. What about treatment? Uh, 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 for Talking about treatment from an evolutionary perspective is very important to be aware of this distinction. Um, symptoms are not all the same. Uh, in, this is for, applies to general medicine too. Uh, there are these functional symptoms, and this is the kind of symptoms that general clinicians are able to recognize. So symptoms that, that are related in a sense to a broken machine. You should imagine the body like a machine. When the machine is broken, there are some symptoms like, for example, seizures, jaundice, or coma. But many symptoms in general medicine, and probably in psychiatry, are adaptive symptoms. So are reactions of the organism to the process of disease. Uh, good examples coming from general medicine are pain, uh, fever, uh, vomiting, uh, all these symptoms can be defenses against the disease process. I'll give you just a very brief examples coming from obstetrics. Now we have evidence that uh, nausea and vomiting during the first trimester probably are defenses against uh, um, toxic products. Uh, these are data collected in a large number of women. It's interesting that women with the highest frequency of nausea and vomiting during the first three months of pregnancy, they have the lowest frequency of miscarriages and abortion. In this environment, you should consider that, of course, the evolutionary origin of these symptoms was in an environment probably was much more toxic than the environment we live now. But even now, collecting data on contemporary women, it's possible to have this relationship between these symptoms that, of course, are not pleasant. So this is important, you know. Suffering sometimes is very adaptive. And so uh, the evolutionary process was not directed to happiness, was directed to a biological adaptation. So probably it's the same in psychiatry. Probably there are symptoms that we are uh, diagnosing in our patients that they are in reality are defenses against um, some malfunctioning. And it's very important for the clinician to be aware of this difference in terms of treatment. You know what is the risk in general medicine of what we call symptomatic therapy. Symptomatic therapy means that we are treating the symptoms, but we are not treating the disease. There are important data coming from infectious disease. Uh, for example, uh, in uh, small children, uh, that when they have uh, trivial infectious disease, if you low the fever with antipyretics without treating the basic disease, the, prog the prognosis is worse. Because fever is a mechanism for impeding uh, viruses and bacteria to grow. Uh, what about psychiatry? 
This is an interesting paper published by uh, Randy Nessie some years ago. So they uh, say we are treating depression as a single entity and we are describing depression as a single entity. But if you look at the profile of symptoms that we can observe in depressed patients according to the cause, the environmental cause of depression, you find very different profiles. And they say we can interpret these differences based on the um, evolutionary significance of the different symptoms for opposing the uh, conditions that was able to produce depression. So for example, if you look at the profile failure at an important goal, that it's a common cause of depression, you see that the, the most important symptoms in, in these people are pessimism, self-reproach, so ways to disinvest emotional investment from the goal that was not possible to obtain. The profile after the death of the loved one is completely different. The prevalence of symptoms is related to symptoms that communicating, are communicating the need to be helped. So are important signals for obtaining uh, social help. And they explain, you know, the relationship between the cause of depression and the possible adaptive symptoms in this slide. Another uh, important uh, information for clinicians comes from uh, pharmacological treatment of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, it's very common to treat people uh, arriving at the emergency room for um, a major trauma with benzodiazepines. Take, for example, the case of a girl um, with, a, with um, an exper terrible experience of rape arriving in the emergency room, we treat uh, uh, her with uh, benzodiazepine. Well, now we have data that treating with benzodiazepine, people uh, having a major trauma, is a cause for, of post-traumatic stress disorder. It's very interesting that if you treat these people with the hydrocortisone, that it's exactly the physiological mechanism following trauma in a natural condition, you have a, a lower <coughs> frequency of post-traumatic stress disorder. This is confirmed by animal models. So the same happens in experimental studies with rats. Okay. So um, summarizing the, the general principle of Darwinian psychiatry in terms of therapy, uh, we can say that the primary aim of therapeutic intervention is to help the patient to achieve short-term biological goals that are related to functioning. Adaptive symptoms should be distinguished from dysfunctional symptoms and the intervention strategies vary with the level of patient's functional capacity. This is very important because probably some disorders are related to very hostile environments. So th the person has the normal capacities for adapting, but the environment is very bad. In these cases, of course, it's very important to identify the environmental and personal factors that interfere with the achievement of short-term biological goal and develop alternative models for um, coping with the environment. In, instead, in people with suboptimal capacities, it's very important to try to improve functional capacities, but at the same time, one important point is migration to more favorable environments. I, find, uh, I found recently a very interesting paper by Peter Tyer about needle therapy, that it's related to develop an environment for the patient that it's better than the normal environment. And practically, this kind of approach is not uh, present now in clinical psychiatry. Much we should consider that. So finally, I, I outlined it some years ago this mnemonic for uh, summarizing the basic point of uh, the Arrhenia psychiatry applied to clinics. Uh, the mnemonic is GOAL. It uh, means give less weight to uh, symptoms, uh, observe and measure behavior, assess functional capacities, and leave your office. Try to uh, observe people in the real world 
with the new technological advancement that probably will be available in a few years. Thank you. Well, Professor Tracy, thank you very much. This is one of the most exciting uh, lectures I've had for a while. Thank you. And it brought to mind, actually, perhaps the two most important psychiatrists that have ever lived. One is Kreppelin, who spent a lot of time observing patients. And that's why I think his uh, notion of schizophrenia has persisted. And they've tried to do better with, with computer models in the Munich, and they couldn't. He's described the clinical picture of schizophrenia. And of course, the other one is Bowlby that you mentioned. And perhaps our child psychiatry colleagues have an advantage here in that uh, they can observe the children more than we can observe uh, the adults. Can I ask you, where can one get training in English for this method of recording and observa uh, observations of pa patients that you have? Described. Is it possible? Yeah, is it possible that the, the problem is that really time consuming, you know? So clinicians don't like to lose time. They love so much reading scales because they are very brief, you know? Uh, the, the method requires that you make a video recording and then you have a trained observer to decode nonverbal behavior. <laughs> it takes about, you know, uh, one hour for examining a short video about 10 minutes. So it's really time consuming based on current method because if we had the method they used in Hollywood, that would be very simple because they put, you know, some stuff on the face of the person and automatically the computer is able to decode facial expressions, but they use that for movies, not for science. You know, I don't know any software that was developed for science to have this kind of automatic decoding of facial expression and nonverbal behavior. That, that would, would be very useful for clinicians. So if there are any ambitious young researchers, here is a, a good idea, I think. Any questions, please? John. Um, I found your distinction between dysfunction and adaptive um, very helpful. I, I see a lot of people who have trauma and traumatic experiences and sometimes one is required to write reports for lawyers, and what lawyers want is a diagnosis. And what I was thinking about was what you said at the beginning about the validity of psychiatric diagnoses. We have post-traumatic stress disorder, and then we have this other thing called adjustment disorder. Do you think diagnosing adjustment disorder is a pathologizing of, of, normal, exist of, of normal life? Yeah, but th this is an important question about, you know, the, the medicalization of some conditions, in particular adjustment disorder as a possible <laughs> medicalization of reaction to trauma. I, I think that, of course, m medical diagnosis in general and psychiatric disorder in particular is related to the cultural, uh, social, ethical values of the society where the patient lives. Now we live in a society where suffering is really taboo. So we don't want suffering. And many conditions that are related to suffering are given a medical diagnosis. So I saw people with very minor conditions in terms of trauma that are given the, the um, diagnosis of adjustment disorder because they, they are not able to change the situation they are living. So I think that it's very important in these cases to help the patient, because of course we want to diminish suffering, but at the same time to examining the capacity of the patient to change the environment, to cope with the environment, and uh, without allowing the patient to stay calm in his or her diagnosis, because that's the situation that is very common, you know? And probably the legal system is very important in promoting this approach, okay? So the environment is very bad, I want the diagnosis, I am sick, and so I have no responsibility for changing things. I think that it's probably related to our cultural values. I don't know if you agree about that. I, mean, I think there's something very interesting about victim status, isn't there? That, that actually having a diagnosis gives you a status. Uh -huh. And I think that, I suppose it <coughs> goes back to the question I think the previous speaker raised about the ethics of it what we do ethically when we give, when we make a diagnosis. 
I mean, certainly, for instance, I certainly some, some, see some people where I think there is a pathologization of grief. I think grief for a lot of people is a normal adaptive as well. But there are some people who are genuinely, I think, have some sort of pathology. And whether we then diagnose it, I think, is, it, I think is a real challenge for us psychiatrists. Yes, so the, question, the point is that uh, there's a question about who is a victim and what is pathological, for example, in grief and what are uh, places in the medicalization of grief, for yeah. example. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, in other culture, uh, the, the um, you know, adjustment to suffering is much more easier than in our culture. Uh, of course, I think that the, 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 the main goal of medicine is to help people uh, f to reach well-being. So it's not, you know, curing disease. Probably this, wa this was a very old perspective for medicine. At the same time, I think that it's very important to inform people that there are ways for changing the situation and that the diagnosis should not be, you know, a stop. Uh, in the, to to the, the strategies to change the environment. Thank you very much uh, for a brilliant presentation, Alfonso. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to make a, a, a kind of comment that uh, you know agrees uh, with the uh, with the issue of uh, uh, um, assessing function and dysfunction. Um, this is an area that is clearly neglected in mainstream psychiatry, and we are all guilty of that. And I think the evolutionary framework uh, can be extremely helpful here just to help us think clearly about what the goals of treatment are. I was at a, um, a conference last year um, and one of the lecturers was talking about schizophrenia and recovering from schizophrenia and he said um, that, um, you know, the, his meta-analysis, 40% of patients recovered fully. So I asked him after he finished his lecture, how many of the patients that he looked at were back at work? That's to say, you know, a basic uh, um, measure of real life functioning, yeah. which is to uh, attain self-sufficiency in one's own culture. Um, and he said he didn't know. He had yeah. no idea how many of the patients who he has diagnosed or uh, assigned full recovery were back at work. And yeah. I think that just tells us what uh, how would important. You, would you mind repeating before yeah, you comment I mean, on uh, this? Yeah, Ri I mean, is, is uh, stressing the the um, fixation of clinical psychiatry with symptoms, you know. So symptoms are important. If I am able to, to cancel, for example, for psychotic patients, delusions or hallucinations, so we can talk about recovery. Recovery means that you are able to come back to your life or, or arrive to your life because even before the onset of symptom, you were not able to function normally. This is real recovery. I, I remember that probably Sigmund Freud said that a um, healthy man is a man that is able to love and to work, you know, because if you don't have an effective life, you don't have uh, human relationships with others, you are not able to work, you are not able to reach your goals in a sense, you are not healthy, even if you have no symptoms. And it's interesting that many pathologies, real pathologies very, with very few symptoms are neglected, even by families. If you have a patient that's spending you all the day with a computer, uh, no friends, no romantic relationship, and so, sometimes they don't ask for help. If you have delusions, hallucination, agitation, immediately you go to the emergency room, you know? Because the, the social perception of uh, what is a psychiatric disorder can change according to the emphasis on symptoms relative to the emphasis on functioning in everyday life. So I agree 100% with you. You bring up Freud, and I think what some good psychoanalytic psychotherapy is, is to help us put up with our suffering. And I think exactly. it's a great shame and very, why we have more depression and anxiety that suffering is banished uh, now from society. Um, um, I just wanted to... Yes. Can you... Uh, I just wanted to thank you for for the suggestions using more uh, ethological methods in psychiatry and also drawing attention to the opportunities that new technologies offer. And I think it's, it's really important to bring those 
together uh, because there is a lot of uh, interest in using new technologies, uh, but actually they also provide an opportunity to to do uh, much larger scale ethological uh, studies in humans, which I think. So the the comment and the question is about the application of the ethological method. I have to say that there are some problems. Um, um, one one important problem is the fact that we uh, we need uh, human ethograms. By human ethograms, I I mean the observation of healthy people in the natural environment. There are no so many studies of healthy people. If you look at the, the, the literature, many studies were conducted in what were called primitive people because they do, don't oppose to observation. For example, the studies by Ibel Ibisfeld in uh, some very different cultures. Some studies of children, small children, because generally they don't oppose to be observed. But in healthy adult people, it's very difficult to conduct uh, observation. If, if now we have probably big data coming from all these video cameras that are everywhere, you know, so probably we have a, 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 a huge ethological study, you know, happening without our, uh, you know, um, participation because we are observed continuously in real life. So it would be possible to get information about the life of people just looking at this data. But I think that the, the change of perspective probably would, would, would be very useful for applying these new technologies to studies. Gentlemen, thank you. Uh, you have talked a lot about uh, observing the patient and take the nonverbal communication in consideration. And, but don't you think uh, the nurses and the psychiatric aides can contribute? in this area. After all, they engage with the patients for uh, hours. Neuroscientists? You say nurses. Nurses, nurses. Uh, nurses. 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 Yeah. nurses and psychiatric okay. aides who yeah. work with the patients in the ward. They engage with and observe the patients for hours on end. I, I agree. I remember that the, uh, the, the first studies by Michael McGuire at UCLA were made by collecting data um, <coughs> reported by nurses because they spend time with patients and they can observe patients in the real environment, even if it's an artificial environment. For example, when they interact during uh, the, the meals or when they have uh, free times during the day. So th that's very important. It's important at the same time to train nurses in what is important to observe, because the, the knowledge about the nonverbal behavior is not so simple. Uh, there are some behaviors, a good example is displacement activities that are completely ignored by uh, clinicians and nurses too. I remember what, when I was a, a resident, <clears throat> you know, we observed the interaction between uh, an autistic child and two important psychiatrists. They were both psychoanalysts uh, behind uh, a screen. And uh, any time the clinicians approached the child, the child uh, yawned, okay? And they interpreted that kind of behavior as a manifestation of boredom. So they say that the child is completely empty in emotional terms and he manif is manifesting um, boredom. In reality, it's an important signal of conflict in non-human primates. So yawning means don't approach me you know, because I'm suffering your presence. If you don't know this kind of information, it's very difficult to interpret what is happening really in the, the, the setting. Thank you. The gentleman at the back. Um, I'd like to thank you for your talk. It's a, a wonderful breadth of coverage of the, the field of both uh, evolution and its application to uh, psychiatric practice in, in day to day. Uh, uh, my question, which I'm, I'm, I'm is really, and I'll start with my question and then explain it a little more, which is, am I wasting my time? Um, as one of the things that I do, I work as a psychotherapist and I train um, core trainees and others in psychotherapy. And one of the things, the methods that I use um, fairly persistently is, is video. So I ask them to, view, to, to video their sessions um, and then look in actually minute detail at the interaction. So I'm kind of interested in these 37 things to look for, because I'm sure I'm not looking for 37. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, the other bit I want to kind of 
put in here really as, as, as something for us to think about is that of course I think the the natural environment for human beings is actually other human beings so in fact we've got the natural environment in which to observe each other that's actually that present all the time um, uh, so therefore and of course part of that observation if you like that we've got is our own reactions to what the other person does and by actually paying attention to that, we can get a lot of data. Now, we have to have a theory behind that. And of course, the, the, the thing I think you've, you've addressed uh, a number of times, of course, the theory is to do with our own interpretation, which might be to do with a map that we have that's not based on evolution um, and the biology, the neurobiology, and the science. So the question really is, am I wasting my time teaching trainees to pick up such minute information and see what the reaction is that they do something different. No, you are not wasting your time. <laughs> and the important point is that probably the natural environment, uh, one of the aspects of the, the natural environment of human beings are uh, other human beings, you know, because we are very social animals. So I agree with you. I think it's very important to observe what happens in the relationship. We have mm, many data now demonstrating that the technical differences between different schools of psychotherapy are not so important relative to the human relationships that we have during psychotherapy, that it's a special relationship. So what we call for many uh, years uh, non-specific factors probably are very specific, and it's the same for the rest of medicine. Now we have many data demonstrating how is important placebo effect but the placebo effect in the clinical relationship is the human relationship. The way the clinician approach the patient, the kind of information gives to the patient, even the, the capacity to touch the patient sometimes, you know, that it's very important for reassuring. And, you know, modern medicine is really neglecting all these aspects because we love so much technical medicine. Uh, good example is Dr. House. You know Dr. House, the best doctor? in the world, the TV series, you know, science. Uh, capacity to understand the mechanism of the disease. If the disease was able to arrive to this office of the doctor without the patient, would be ideal. Because <laughs> I want to treat the disease, I don't want to treat the patient, you know. This is so far from the core of the clinical relationship, that it's a relationship between human beings. Well, that's a wonderful point to stop uh, yeah, this okay. Uh, <laughs> presentation. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.